So one fine summer day, I went racing out of work, eager to start my one-hour commute home and beat the traffic. And I'm cruising along, and I feel the car start to shimmy a little bit, and I hear this flap, flap, flap. So I immediately figure out how to exit three lanes of traffic, get to a safe place, and take a look. And my tire is flat as a pancake. Now, I am a pediatrician with a subspecialty in child abuse pediatrics. So what that means is that by most people's standards, I am smart. I went to school for a really long time. I am a problem solver at work and at home. Now, do I know how to change a tire? Conceptually, yes, I do. Practically, I've done it one time. High school driver's ed 30 years ago. So I'm standing there looking at my tire. I call my husband, and he is patiently trying to walk me through the very simple steps of changing my tire. And I cannot process a single thing that he is telling me. What does a jack even look like? Where is it in this car? I'm going to put it where? You mean I have to get down on the ground? My heart is racing, my breathing is fast, and I cannot solve this simple problem of changing my tire. Now, what was happening to me in that moment? I was experiencing the fight-or-flight response. Now, the fight-or-flight response is one way that the body responds to threat or stress. So that threat could be something big, like something that wants to hurt me or harm me, or something small, like something frustrating or overwhelming, or a flat tire. But regardless of whether it's a threat or a stress, the response by the body is the same, and that is to release adrenaline and cortisol. So biologically, the fight-or-flight response is set up in a predator versus prey situation. So there's something that wants to hurt me or eat me, and I either need to fight it off or run away to survive. Adrenaline and cortisol kick in, it increases my heart rate, it increases my breathing, it gives my muscles a burst of energy so that I can fight this off and survive. Now, that's meant to be very short-lived, which makes sense, because I'm either going to fight it off, I'm going to run away, or I'm going to die, and it's over. And when it isn't short-lived and it continually is triggered, it actually sets up a problem for the body. Another important aspect, though, of the fight-or-flight response is that it effectively cuts us off from using most of our brain. So the fight-or-flight response actually forces us, cuts us off from using the front part of our brain, which is the deep-thinking, problem-solving part and forces us just to use the instinctual, lower brainstem portions of our brain. Now, that also makes sense, because if I'm faced with something that wants to eat me or hurt me, it's not the time to overthink it. It's not the time to make a pro and con list. I just need to react and get safe. So when I was driving along and recognized that something was up with my car, my fight or flight kicked in, enabled me to assess the situation, rapidly exit the highway and get safe. But then it went into hyperdrive as I was continually feeling threatened. Because, you know, I'm smart. I don't know how to change a tire. It's 92 degrees. I'm in a pencil skirt and thinking about crawling around on the ground. So I couldn't get to the front part of my brain and solve this problem. Now, scientists have a fancy word to describe this phenomenon, but I prefer a more simpler characterization of this. And that is to call this lizard brain. And this is because when we are in this state, we are restricted and only able to use the teeny tiny portions of our brains that we share with lizards. And we're cut off from using the front parts, which is the creative, problem-solving, deep-sensing portions of our brain that are essentially the parts that make us the most human. So how does this relate to teenagers? Well, if you're a parent or an educator or a teen yourself, you'll probably agree with me that a lot of times teenagers act like they're just using a little teeny tiny portion of their brain, or that they're barely human. Which also makes sense, because our teens are faced with stresses and threats all day. So those stresses and threats could be small or big by adult standards, but just navigating the social environment of high school is stressful and threatening to a lot of teens. Who are my friends today? Where am I sitting at lunch? Is that person making fun of me? Continually stressful. In addition, so many of the things that our teens are doing are learning brand new skills, so they don't have a habit to fall back on. 
So similar to me, I wasn't in the habit of changing tires, so it was not a, a habit that I could access in that stressful moment. And in fact, even knowing that I should know how to do it or that somebody taught me how was actually more of a stress. So that's continuing to stress our teens as well. The other thing facing our teens is that these lizard-braining teens are surrounding themselves all the time by a whole bunch of other lizard-braining teenagers. So they're constantly triggering one another into this fight or flight. And as an adult who interacts with teens, you know it does not take long interacting with these guys to push you into being a lizard brain yourself. Now this lizard braining in our teens does not necessarily show up as fighting, although it can, but it certainly can show up as fleeing, hiding, trying to avoid things that are scary, or fighting with words with behaviors, with angry posts. And that continual triggering of the fight-or-flight response, as I mentioned, sets up a problem for the body because it can become a learned response. So we see this in abused kids. If we take photographs of humans making facial expressions of different emotions, so like happy, sad, scared, or whatever, and we show those photographs to a bunch of abused kids, they don't see happy, sad, scared, whatever. They see angry, scary, threatening. That person's going to hurt me. They see threat where it isn't there. And they're constantly in fight or flight, and they look to society like kids who have behavioral problems, but actually they're appropriately responding to threat. But that threat isn't really there because they're conditioned to think it's there because of this continual triggering. So what do we do about this for ourselves? Well, there's a different response to stress or threat that humans have access to, and that is the affiliation or tend and befriend response. So this is, instead of seeing threat and responding with a fight or flight response, this is instead seeing a threat and reaching for help. This is asking for help and having somebody help you with that stress or threat, as a one-on-one, -on -one, or joining together as a group to pool resources and overcome a threat together. This is teamwork. This is facilitated by strong social connections and repetitive interactions that build trust. This is not adrenaline and cortisol. This is oxytocin. So oxytocin brings a feeling of joy and of calm and of safety and serenity. And that feeling does not cut us off from our thinking brain and in fact facilitates us using it so we can access that beautiful portions of our brain that make us the most human. So what's getting in the way of this, of us using these? The fight or flight response does not have to be learned. Lizards have it, you have it from birth. It's instinctual. But the tend and befriend response actually has to be learned and practiced. So the things that are getting in the way of this for our teenagers, first and foremost, is that lizards do not make friends with other lizards. Lizards do not form strong bonds with other lizards. When you're just fighting for survival, you're not reaching out and affiliating. A second barrier here is COVID. So COVID, at its height, shut down so many of the normal teen experiences that are, at their core, affiliation training exercises. So things like camp and sports teams and music ensembles and theater, all ways that bring teenagers together, teach them new skills, have them learn and grow together, count on one another, trust one another, and overcome barriers affiliation training. So for a lot of teens, those things were shut down and that time in their life passed them by and they never got that opportunity. And for others, they've replaced it with something different. Now, social media is the way that a lot of those stresses and threats are reaching our teens all the time, in their pocket 24-7. But not everything about social media is bad. Right? Social media allows us to connect with others, can facilitate interactions. But those interactions are different than the true affiliation that I'm talking about. And the feelings of 
joy or togetherness that you get from superficial social media interactions or somebody following you on TikTok is very different and is facilitated by dopamine. Now, dopamine is yet another neurotransmitter. This also brings a sense of joy and of happiness, but it's very fleeting. And when it's gone, we crave it again, and we actually need more of the same stimuli to get that same feeling. Because dopamine is the same neurotransmitter that we see at play in things like gambling or cocaine addiction. So if you're judging your social connection by how many followers you have on TikTok or who's retweeting your posts, you've kind of missed the power of the oxytocin. And in fact, what pediatricians have recognized as the most important factor to help abused kids overcome that fight-or-flight continual response is the presence of what we call an SSNR, a safe, stable, nurturing relationship. So just one adult in their corner who's helping them navigate life and is there when they need them to help with stressors can it change the outcome for those children. And guess what? We all need them. And we need to learn how to be that for other people. So how do we go about doing this? So remember I said that, uh, that the affiliation response has to be taught. But first, we have to actually shift out of fight or flight. Because when you're a lizard, you're not affiliating. So there are steps for this. So the first is to realize that it's happening and respond. So this means when there is a teenager who's lashing out, who's acting poorly, instead of yelling at them, or sending them an angry post, or lecturing, ask yourself, what is threatening that teen? What is stressing my teenager? And just that subtle shift can help you to respond to what's happening and not react as your own lizard. The next is to recognize and reassure. So this is recognize that there are huge emotions here and reassure them that they're okay to feel. So just saying things like, you have so much on your plate right now. Or, no wonder you forgot to do such and such. Look at all these other things you're doing. Or even just saying, well, that sucks, is enough to send the message that you recognize that the feelings are there and to reassure that they're okay. And this is the steps towards building that safe, stable, nurturing relationship. Now, these are all to get us to this final one, this reach and reciprocate. And this is the affiliation piece. This is the reaching for help and reciprocating with help. Just by saying phrases like, how can I help you? Or who else needs help with that? Sends the messages that it's OK to need help. You're worthy of getting help. I'm here to help you. And guess what? Other people need help with this, too. It's all about the affiliation. And whether you are helping or being helped, the oxytocin is the same, the same rush. So it's a win-win. Another key to affiliation is to share your space. And I don't mean share your Twitter handle or your TikTok video. I mean share your physical space. Allow people into your circle. Because by sharing your physical space, you actually then begin to share your mental space and your emotional space. That phrase that there are safety in, that there's safety in numbers goes whether you're talking about physical safety, psychological safety, or mental safety. And by sharing your space, you, allow, you start to see when other people are hurting, and you can help them, and they start to see when you're help, hurting, and they can help you. You're building your affiliation network. So our teens are struggling here. They're pushed into fight or flight all day, every day, by the stressors and threats that they're faced with. And they need to be taught how to affiliate. We can do that by realizing it's happening and helping to respond and not react as our own lizards and pushing them farther along. By recognizing these huge emotions that they have and reassuring them that it's OK to feel them. And then reaching and reciprocating with help, teaching them how to help one another. We can help them harness the power of oxytocin 
to shift fight or flight into affiliate and flourish. So just back to me on the side of the road, I'm pacing, I'm sweating, I'm swearing, and a man appeared, a stranger to me, saw my distress, got down on his knees, and changed my tire in like 25 seconds flat. He changed so much more for me that day than just my tire. And I was so flustered that day, I never even asked his name. But I really hope he's watching today. Thank you.